Hello there. Welcome to this week's episode of the Data Radio Show. This week, I'm sitting down with Max Tessera. He's worked across a number of fields in education and corporate change, particularly around uh, technology and transformation spaces. You know, it, it's uh, teaching people how to use new tech, showing people how new tech is going to change what they do, particularly with corporate clients. He is a very, very popular consultant in this field, uh, working out of Australia. So let's sit down catch up with Max, learn a little bit about him, and also how he, as somebody who educates people on this, sees the world changing thanks to AI and Gen AI. Uh, joining me today, I have Max Tessera. Uh, you are a lifelong expert in this sort of digital transformation space, um, which I guess is code for you've done a lot of stuff. Is, is that is, is that a fair summary? Yes, yes. Um, I... Uh, for longer than I want to confess, I guess I've been in the in in the uh, advisory space, working for you know, companies like PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, IBM's business consulting. I started up my own consultancy for a period of time for about eight, eight, eight or ten years, and co-founded another consultancy. Really, I guess I've worked at the intersection of people, technology and change and so those three things coming together if i had to describe where i spend most of my time it's actually helping large organizations drive adoption of new ways of working that are enabled by technology i imagine then that that sort of the goalposts shift on that a lot over time you know the technology we had 30 years ago is completely different to how we use and interact with technology today Absolutely. I mean, it's 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 moved, and it's it's the pace of change is becoming even quicker mm -hmm. now. I, I think. Um, I'm also an educator at the at the business school in Melbourne, Melbourne Business School, and um, University of New South Wales, uh, the Australian Graduate School of Management, and you know, focusing on executive education and demand for education has gone up, particularly because of what you've just mentioned. That sort of the you know the change um, over the years, over the decades, but more so in recent times. Um, with the whole buzz around generative AI and what and, and how that sort of captured the world, um, and I've been lucky that uh, I've managed to take a bit of time out of corporate world, uh, out of the workforce, to spend and indulge myself in generative AI in, in the last few months. Combination of um, uh, formal training and hands-on experience and just getting myself in in there um, in the generative AI space which is kind of still emerging right mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah absolutely and if you know if you think about where this could end up talking about the pace of change and where it could go there's those two very polarizing views one which is that apocalyptic view of you know generative AI is going to take over the world and robots are going to rule mm -hmm. us uh, but very other side, you know, utop utopian world of, you know, we've, we've, we've dealt with things like disease and inequality financially across the globe and, you know, solved, you know, we've got a, a, an abundance of, uh, um, you know, ability to live in, this, in, in, in the world and we don't have to work any longer. Um, very polarizing views. And of course, it's probably somewhere in between, but um, as I start to understand this technology even more and more and where we've got to today, I think we are at that really interesting point where regardless of which way it can go, we're, we're, we're in an interesting place, interesting time to live in um, with, the, with where technology is going. Uh, and, and really for me, I think I'm probably more on the half full rather than half empty. I think we're probably on the optimistic side rather than the pessimistic side of where things might end up. Yeah. The Star Trek future, not the Terminator future. Yes, exactly. <laughs> with your roles teaching, you, you obviously must come through, come into contact with a lot of younger people, sort of newer generations that would be a bit more of a digital native than some of those older generations that are wanting to sort of retrain in the world of generative AI. Are you finding different sort of outlooks, different attitudes or skill sets that are coming through in younger generations that people aren't necessarily aware of if they're looking at it as a retraining option? There's always this this idea that the younger generation are highly savvy with with um, with technology and therefore have a very different outlook. I think maybe to a certain extent that might be true, but actually, you know, 
COVID has changed things um, and, and, and even the older generation have had to get to grips with technology in a way that they've never had to in the past. And, and so I think of my, I use a, a litmus test of my mum and dad, they, they're sort of churchy people and you can go to church. So they, they got their, their, their masses through streaming online and then they started to get into that whole thing, right? And so very, very, these are people who are 80, 80. 80 years old. Um, and so um, having to kind of order your groceries online. And so so things have changed. So yes, there is a there is a difference, the younger people. Um, my, my focus on education has been at the executive level. And what I do notice is that there's even more demand from a, an older generation to understand. With a change management lens on, when you think of what it's going to take in large corporates to change, Education is a really important thing. And quite often in, in the past, education, you know, change management interventions have include train, things like training, but that's been very much at the operational level. Whereas what I see with generative AI is actually a demand and a need, even if there isn't a demand, there's a need from board level to executive level, to middle management, to the rest of the employees. And so actually everybody's hungry to understand this better. Either they're hungry for it or they don't know that they need it, but they do need it in order to be able to succeed. And so from a change management standpoint, actually thinking about AI literacy across the organization and what it's going to take to support organizations, you know, uh, exploit um, this new technology as it comes through, um, AI literacy is a really important component and it goes across the board. Do yeah. you find with those people coming in for change management plans and, and sort of working out how they're going to do that, any kind of misconceptions that people bring to the table? Is there a common misconception around what AI offers or the, the way it's going to change things? Common misconception. I guess the thing that comes to mind in particular would be that they're captured by generative AI. And so there's this idea that um, generative AI can be used across the whole of your value chain. Um, and that's, that is right, but actually it may not be the best tool for the job. And so there's, the misconception really is around uh, understanding traditional AI and generative AI and understanding that there are horses for courses. And so people are, are in this consumed by generative AI and what it could offer, and quite rightly so, because it's quite different. Um, but um, but at the same time, I think you're going to miss a trick if you just focus in on generative AI. Actually, there's there's, there's, a, there's a whole load of technologies out there, and traditional AI and machine learning is actually equally important. Yeah. How do you think AI is going to change your job? My job? Uh, yeah. Well, I think I think that AI is actually going to change everyone's everyone's role. It's already starting to change everyone's role. Um, and quite often there's, a, there's actually, that's, a, that's, that's interesting because as, as humans, we tend to, I guess, um, over, over estimate the impact on the short term impact of new technology and underestimate the longer term impact of technology. And so um, when you think about it, uh, I've heard a lot in the press about uh, Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs put out this, they're, they're a conservative organization, right? So they're, they're not the most, you know, out there risk, risk taking organization. Um, and so they, they put something out um, that's been used consistently uh, in, in quotations in the press um, and their research, which was done with an economic lens and they took the analysts and they did, they looked at 2000 roles and they said, and the focus was, although they said AI, the focus was generative AI. What can generative AI, if we break down the 2000 roles into its tasks, where can generative AI actually um, make an impact? Um, and the, the misquote is that, um, is that, is that generative AI will replace 300, 300 million roles across full-time roles across the world, 300 million. Yeah, and if you think about that, if you just, let's explore that for a second. So 300 million, the estimate of 
people in the workforce today around the globe is 3.5 billion. So 300 billion is about almost 9%. Let's round it up 10% to make it easy for a conversation. That means, Paul, for every 10 people you know in the workforce, one person will lose their job, will fully lose their job to generative AI. And that's generative AI, not just AI and not just technology. And there's a whole load of other things that are disrupting the market uh, and disrupting the future of work. Um, now, that's a lot when you think about it. Well, I think that's a lot for a conservative organization to make that prediction. Um, but actually, it's a misquote because what they actually did was they said that the cumulative compound effect of generative AI in through production um, sort of pro productivity improvements would release the equivalent of 300 million full-time roles. That's not the same as 300 million roles disappearing, right? And so actually, I think that in the short term, the focus will be on optimizing and automating tasks as opposed to full roles. Eventually, you know, if you're asking me, the question was, how is it going to impact my role? Well, it already is impacting my role, but I think it will impact everybody's role, but not necessarily now. I don't think that I'm going to lose my job now because of generative AI. And most jobs are going to be, I mean, over time, yes, there's the likelihood is that every role and every job will be impacted um, to one extent or another. And there will be job losses, in my view. There will be job losses. Um, but it's it's... It, it, is, it is not as um, drastic a change in the short term, I think. In the long term, yes, but in the short term, probably not. And so, um, yeah, we've got to be careful about what's reported in the news, I guess. That's, no, that's not new to anyone. <laughs> that's true. That, that, yeah, that's definitely true. Hey, have you come across people who have that fear that, oh, Gen AI is here, I'm out of work. Yeah, it's going to make everything we do redundant. I think the fear, the fear that people have is that that the execs in large businesses are making decisions that will impact on people's roles and people don't know that it's happening. And so they're kind of worried that that's happening. So there's this sort of, um, are they worried that they're going to lose a job tomorrow? Probably uh, not enough people are paying attention to that, I'd say. Because um, I'm not saying they're going to lose their job tomorrow, but there are things you can do to prepare. And so, um, are they? Are they? Um, but they're probably more worried that things are happening in the background that they're unaware of. Um, and uh, and so, um, what should I pay attention to uh, is is probably part of the part of the issue. In terms of the the sort of the corporate world out there looking at options for them, and and looking at generative AI as, as say a cost saving measure do you think that there is for somebody like yourself who does consulting as an example do you think there is um concern that you should have you know that, that they're going to start relying on something like gen ai to learn about gen ai so they don't necessarily feel they need that human interaction to actually guide them um so can you express that question again so so if you're dealing with so, say you've got an executive team, and this is from a personal experience where you have yeah. executives who, who think new product, new technology, great idea, we'll focus on that. Gen AI is often pitched as, you know, this is going to give you the answers. You know, chat GPT is going to tell us everything. Um, yeah. So we don't need to have that human interaction anymore. So how does that impact, say, a role like yours where you're there helping people sort of navigate these changes when they think that the changes are then the answer itself? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, is there still room for human interaction? Is that yeah. is that what really yeah, what's it's, really it's pretty much save, save our roles? Is is mm -hmm. sort of the underlying question that that sits behind that. Um, well, the the scenario we talked about before of, of abundance, etc. If that does happen, then there's probably no need for people to work. So, yes, that could happen. But will it happen in my lifetime? Absolutely not. Will it happen in my in my children's lifetime possibly not but my grandchildren's lifetime possibly yes if i have to think of some kind of time frame so how are we going to get there well um there's always a need for human interaction um and so if you think of a a doctor you know somebody in the medical practice um there's 
technology now and, and generative AI is included in that technology that can support the medical um, a, 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 in a medical environment, uh, reading scans and, and doing that better. But even, even now and in the future, I think there's still a need for the interaction between the doctor and the patient around what that scan actually means. And so will they, will that, will that, the need for that to di disappear over time? Who knows? I haven't got a crystal ball. My sense though, is that there will still be a need for human interaction um, in the flow of work um, for most jobs, not all jobs, but for most jobs. So I don't know if that answers oh, your question. Does, yeah. but I, I, it's not it's not just a case of wiping that off the even even where things are happening right now right customer service mm. call centers um you know call center agents are augmented with generative ai um, and so that they have more information at the fingertips that they have histories of conversations that they've had with with um with the person on the other side of the phone and so um, or the, the conversation that person has had with the, with the company as a whole. And so that's, that's, that's so much more powerful for those, for those, um, uh, for those agents. Um, but in the future, maybe there will be a combination of human agents and silicon agents that are dealing directly with the, with the, with the, with the, with the customer. And then there'll be a handover point mm -hmm. at some point gets to a point where human interaction is required. Um, a bit like how chatbots are used today, but in the future, it will be far more with natural language processing, um, digital humans, you know, avatars, that the whole interaction, a lot of the interaction can be taken by a digital agent, a silicon agent. And so teams will be made up of silicon and humans, uh, potentially. Um, and when there's a need at the the trick is understanding when there's a need for human intervention and the seamless integration of those two types of, of, of in future employees together to be able to work effectively. Um, and the, that, the, that it doesn't impact on the customer experience. In fact, it, it enhances the customer experience. That, that's actually a really fascinating topic for me. My, my partner works in a call center. They train people there. And one of their clients is a New Zealand based airline that they do uh, text-based help services with because they have accents and they know that our, the market here in New Zealand doesn't necessarily want to work with somebody who's speaking with an accent. This turns them off. But from a text-based option, not a problem. You can't tell on the other end what the accent is of, of the person that's dealing with you. But they've looked at some sort of chatbot option and it just doesn't work. It doesn't come across the sort of nuances and the... the colloquialisms that show up in language that I'm yeah. guessing Gen AI is still running to play catch up with. Uh, it is, but it will play, it will catch up. Um, and it's just like, you know, when everything moved offshore and we had these offshore call centers in India, Manila, et cetera, the, the initial attempts at doing that were pretty, pretty in the, in the space you've talked about where accents were very different. Understanding of the country that you're speaking to was quite different. But, you know, humans caught up pretty quickly and people were inducted into, so if they were supporting Australia, they were inducted into Australian culture, understanding local, um, you know, local language and mannerisms and, um, and the, way that, you know, the way that people think in those countries. And so there's no reason why a silicon agent can't understand those things. In fact, they can probably remember them and understand them equally equally as good or, or better because they can have they've got a massive ability to, 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 to understand knowledge now lots of challenges in the way of getting there hallucination bias you know all the rest of it data protection all the stuff that we know um, and we read about all the time um, but could they get there yeah they could yeah. Hmm. actually data protection brings up a really good question as well in that um, machine learning obviously has certain rules it has to follow and certain guidelines it has to follow um, because that's how machine learning works. When it comes to things like data protection, um, changing rules around the, around the world um, sort of kick in and, and alter things, how easy is it for something like a generative AI to adapt to different regions' rules? To adapt to different regions' rules. 
Um, yeah. so, so for example, GDPR is like the, the, the be all and end all when it comes to um, data protection around the world. Um, here in New Zealand, we have a really simplified version of what you guys call the Privacy Act. So we, we don't have anywhere near those kind of protections. Um, but we follow GDPR rules because we know that's what the gold standard is. Um, but they don't have to. Like, like there's nothing that forces a New Zealand-based company that's not dealing with European markets to do to, to follow those rules. They just they they tend to. For something like a generative AI model, how easy would it be to sort of upscale from look, this is basic privacy act to GDPR and incorporate it, or would it be? Are we more likely to see people going like this is the gold standard of what the outcomes should be? So we need to generate machines that do that. Um, right. So I think there's two elements to this, right? And so one is the application of the legislation and the adherence to it. Um, and at the end of the day, we're still in a place where Genetic AI isn't defining itself. We're helping define itself. And so we're the humans are the ones that are putting the guide rails in. They're developing the applications that sit around the use of a large language model. And so Large language models have the capability to understand masses of data and translate that. And so to, under, to help understand the legislation. So if I take, just going to take an adjacent example to what you've given, um, there's legislation coming out around, um, you know, net zero and sustainability. And every country around the world has got slightly different views. And even within countries, like in America, in the States, each of the states have a different kind of, you know, set of legislation. And so for humans to understand all that and manage that, it's, ma it's, a, it's a massive challenge. But training a large language model around global and local legislation and keeping that up to date with the latest legislation so they can advise and give guidance, so that large language model can advise and give guidance on what you need to pay attention to for your company in your industry, for example, in your country. That is something that I suspect a large language model trained in the right way um, would be better at doing than a human. Uh, but if you're creating an application to do a life cycle um, analysis of an asset or define an emissions boundary, then that's far more structured. And so once you've understood it's helped you understand, you can use it to help you understand the legislation. But once you've understood that, you need to create a much more structured um, uh, a structured set of instructions and a step by step of what needs to be done. Um, and in that sense, it's kind of more like traditional programming than it is creative, you know, creative, uh, a, um, a creative view of, of, of what needs to happen. And so um, I actually think that um, for me, it's, it's balancing both of those, using the creativity and the ability to process data where it's required for us to understand, followed by a very structured process of how to put that data and that understanding into practice in the real world. And, and that's where you need the structure, the programming to kind of focus um, that capability on delivering what, what, what you're asking it to deliver. For people who are out there looking at, at either, you know, career change or just sort of mm -hmm. straight out of school wanting to get into to into this field, what sort of a device would you give them? Um, well, given given the 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 we're sitting on a a data radio show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I think about if I think about data professionals, just 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 let's just start there, right? Rather than uh, people coming out of out of college. Um Data professional, whether you're an, a data analyst or a data engineer or a data scientist or even just thinking about the space, um, I kind of go back to first principles. And, uh, and at a fundamental level, generative AI uh, and AI general, gen, the traditional AI, um, the secret source is going to be no surprise to anybody on the call, but the secret source of getting that stuff to work is data, right? And so um, th that whole idea of garbage in, garbage out, 
Um, but it's even more, more pronounced than that. Um, you know, they, data professionals are the closest profession, the profession that's most likely to be able to pivot and succeed in the future, uh, in the future world of AI. And what do I mean by that? Let me kind of just paint a picture and you're going to have to suspend, suspend, I guess, suspend your, 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 your um, reality for a second. But let's assume, let's take us back to, I don't know if you're old enough to remember working environments of the 80s um, and early 90s, but... Um, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so in those times, um, mobile phones had just come out. Not everyone had one, but we kind of, a lot of people did have one. It was starting to get used at work. But if you suspend your judgment for a second and take anybody who's sort of listening to this call and their understanding of mobile phones and how they work today. And we just, you know, we port you back to that time. And it's like all of a sudden, you know, there's a shift. You're in this place where there's, there's even before the flip phone, where phones didn't have, t they, they had text, but not very, mm -hmm. very clever text. You know, it was quite cumbersome. Uh, and, a, and a mobile phone was usually large, largely used for making calls. There's no GPS. There's no, but there were no cameras mm -hmm. on it. And you're, plonked in the middle of a, of a corporate environment, knowing what you know about your, your favorite Samsung or your iPhone or whatever else you use and all the capabilities that, that we now take for granted. And you're asked to help your, the rest of your colleagues understand what you could do with an iPhone or you know, a mobile phone with all the capabilities that it has. You could do it, right? You could start to think about how an organization could use it because you, you're, you're in that space. And that's the way I see data professionals, actually. You're in the space of data and AI and analytics, uh, where it's, whether it's machine learning or it's kind of neural networks or it's large language models. And data is the, is the critical secret source to make all that work. So it's time, if, if they're not already, in the limelight, it's time for data scientists to get into the limelight because it's it's your time. It's a really exciting time for data professionals to be around. Uh, and so what do you need to do to do that? You kind of need, my advice is understand how value is created in an, in in um, in AI. Where How is value created through AI? Um, you know, use of, of internal data is an important element. So I, this, all that thing, you know, RAG, um, you know, how do you use RAG to train uh, a large language model? Um, I have no programming experience at all. I can't code to save my life, but I've got a large language model on my laptop. I've got a front end digital human that I use to interact with the large language model. That's got RAG training. That's got get to, for my particular use cases. That's done on low code, no code basis. And so if I can do it, anybody with an understanding of data has got a head start. So understand what, how value is created. Think about agentic work, workflows, which is kind of just all coming out now. How does that create? How do you think about workforce where some of the work is automated and some of the work is human or oriented? Um, AI in the flow of work, where can AI be used? Just get yourself around and understand things like, you know, bigger isn't necessarily better with large language models. And so, the large, some large, large language models do things that, that are much more creative really well. Others do things that are much more structured, like programming really well. Understand the differences of a Mistral versus a Llama and getting your head around that stuff is what will allow you to be that person who's brought the iPhone from the future into the 1980s and help your, help your, your organization deal with the opportunities that are that, that can present itself by generative AI, but also the challenges and risks. You know, we talk about typical common risks like bias and data privacy and cybersecurity. But if you think about your industry and the use case, the specific use case, are there any dangers associated with that? Um, specifically, like we men I mentioned, the medical practice. How, how do you get generative AI if you happen to be in an industry that that's focused in on, on 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 medicine, how do you get generative AI 
through the whole stages of approvals that are, might be required and what do you need to do that what do you need to do to ensure that generative ai product will 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 adhere to those uh, stage gates that are required you required to go through so massive massive opportunities for the data scientist the data professional to be involved in pivoting and and really just flourishing in this in this world is what i'd say um, and so um, get yourself prepared um, and you're ready you're ready you've already got one foot in the limelight just move into it because actually whilst what's different about generative AI to, to, to traditional AI is it's accessible there's two things really one is speed and one is accessibility and when I think of speed is it is it really different uh, machine uh, AI has been around for 50 years but it didn't take off the way generative AI is and it's because People have accessibility and speed, the speed at which things are changing. I'm amazed at what we can do now, which we couldn't do six months ago. Things like text to text to graphics or text to video. You know, those things are coming out on a daily, weekly basis. And so, um, you know, it's the speed of, 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 of change is one thing. It's, and that's very different to how it was before. I mean, if you remember, people compare it to dot com internet mm. but i'm old enough to remember how slow it was when you when internet started we take it for granted but you had to put, put a modem connect yeah. the phone to the modem and then, you know and that, that the, whole the process. internet screened at you when you tried to join it it was yeah yeah and it took it. forever exactly. to download a single picture totally totally and so um and where that took a long time to change whereas now with generative ai the the, the evolution to innovations there's a whole lot of hype yes but there's also some real innovations that are coming out and they're happening at the speed that they haven't happened before. The other difference is accessibility. So, so organizations and individuals are getting accessibility to those because they can, you don't need to be a programmer. Like I just explained, I've got all that stuff on my laptop, but also to use chat GBT, you don't even have to be a particularly good prompt engineer. You can, you can actually use it without, with just the natural language that you would normally use and you'll get better over time and you get better results, but you can use it. What, what, what the challenges is, is understanding how to use it and optimize it, understanding the risks associated with it, understanding what I talked about in terms of value, where does value come from in this new generative AI space. And so whilst in the, in the old times of machine learning and, um, and, and AI, traditional AI, to get it to work, you had to have business people, IT people, and data scientists together in a room and you couldn't engage with the business people because they weren't interested mm -hmm. now you have a whole load of business people who are so interested in this but what they don't realize because it's so accessible right now is to actually optimize generative ai solutions you know getting rag to work is a real challenge it's not as easy as just sticking your documents in and getting you know, back to databases and managing the data that's in there and keeping it up to date and chunking it in, in, in a way that, that, a, that, that a large language can move. All very technical um, uh, and data related challenges. And so to get it to work, you still need data scientists, you still need business people, you still need technologists in a room together to get it work. And the core component that's going to draw everybody together to make it work is data. Uh, and I think that if I was a data scientist or somebody thinking about getting into the data space, it's a great, a really exciting time. Perfect. Yeah. One last and, question for you. How do people find you online if they want to connect? Oh, um, oh yeah. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the, 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 the best, the best way to get, uh, to get in touch with me. Um, my surname is to Sarah T H E. S E I R A. So these I R A. Uh, there's not many of us out there, uh, and so um, Max Tessera on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me quite easily. Would love to connect with uh, with people um, and uh, follow my posts and um, get in touch. It'd be great. Yep, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Max. It's much appreciated. I learned heaps today. <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, you've been very kind to listen to my ramblings and uh, yeah, hopefully they resonated. Hey, thanks again for watching this week's episode of the Data Radio Show. 
or listening if you're on the podcast version. Don't forget you can track Max down really simply by following the link that we've got in the bio to his uh, LinkedIn profile. He says he'd love to connect with people, wants to get to meet more people from around the world. So you know what to do, just follow that link. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe, tell people about this content piece, let everybody know what's going on so that they can check it out as well and maybe learn a little bit from it. Until next time, have a great week and may the force be with you.